the name of Christ, amen. Today we're going to be taking a look at our epistle reading from the book of Hebrews, the second chapter. But before that, I, I wanted to, to note to you how remarkable it is that we live in a city that is so full of clubs, social groups. Uh, we were privileged yesterday to have the Garden Club of Orange come and visit our church and uh, see the, the beautiful landscaping here and especially the, the vegetable gardens that the kids have planted. But for many years, many centuries, one of the ways societies around the world have tried to find togetherness is clubs, social groups, charitable organizations. I'm a member uh, of a few. I think most involve cars, but still. But in our little city alone, in Orange, people gather at uh, the Old Town Preservation Association. There's the Orange Senior Center. Did you know the city of Orange has two Rotary Clubs? We have the Women's Club of Orange. We have the Greater Orange Community Arts Club. We have the Gardens Club. We have the Elks Lodge. And that's just a few. Lots of clubs. Now, you know what they all have in common? Is a group of people, uh, kind of like-minded, get together, talk about things, and have snacks. That's pretty much universal, and it is definitely required, the snack part. And doesn't that sound a little bit like church? And we are good at snacks at this church. We take pride in our snacks. And snacks are important. Do not get me wrong. Whatever else you hear from the message this morning, do not in any way, he, in any way hear that I am suggesting that we lessen our snacks. But I do want to look at our text this morning and ask the question, what distinguishes the church from a social club, from the Elks Lodge, from the Women's Club, any of these other gatherings of people that get together to find camaraderie, social connection? What distinguishes the church from a club? It's very simple. Verse one of our text in Hebrews two lays it out very clearly. It's the word of God. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. Our text this morning wraps up of the, of the praise of the congregation, the praise of our group to God. Why? Because of the snacks? No. Because of the social interaction, the longtime friendships, the gathering and social connections, no, because of the word, the word of God. In fact, verse one says something in, in uh, the original Greek that tends to be rather clipped often and, and straightforward in its language. Whenever you see a lot of adjectives or adverbs, you know that somebody is really trying to make a point. And verse one says, pay much closer attention to what we have heard. And what is it that we have heard that we do not want to drift away from? And notice, we're not told it will ever be taken away from us, but that we drift from it. Notice that it does not say that we typically run from it screaming. We drift. We slowly put it aside. Slowly start focusing on other things that look more appealing. Snacks. 
But what is this thing that we don't want to drift away from, what we must pay much closer to that we have heard, verse 2, the message. And that in the original Greek is a word that even if you've never studied a day of Greek in your life, have probably heard logos, the word, the word of God. The word that was declared by angels out in the fields, declared by angels to prophets that is proved to be reliable. The word that was declared in verse 3 at first by the Lord himself, Christ the word. And it was attested to us by those who heard the apostles. And then God continues to bear witness by signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will, not ours, but by his, in ways large and small, so that word continues on today. But here's the bottom line. The difference between a church and a social club is the word of God. And if we drift away from the word of God, we're nothing else, no different, than an Elks Lodge, than the Masons, than any other well-meaning group of people that gather together to have a good time and even have snacks. Not as good as our snacks, but snacks. It's the word. That's it. We call that as Lutheran sola scripturae. Everything that we do in the church comes from the word of God. Everything that makes us distinct from those who are not of Christ comes to us through the means of the word of God. It's what makes our baptism have power. It's what gives power to the Lord's Supper that we partake. It is all about the word, the word of God alone. Not how we feel, not what we think, not what we like, not what we dislike, not even snacks. The word of God. And in Hebrews, we're given a warning about that. That we should not drift away. Hebrews 2, 3. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? We are told very clearly that it is going to be tempting, always, to drift from the word, to become just like everybody else, to become just like every other group that focuses more on a particular passion, a hobby, people, human beings, eating, driving, gardening. None of those things are bad but none of those things are saving. None of those things are eternal, and none of those things will truly bring, bring fullness and meaning and life to our lost souls. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? In other words, it doesn't matter what else we do. We can have the prettiest church, the nicest pews, the best potlucks, but if the word of God is drifted away from, all meaningless. In the Lutheran Witness, uh, published in April of 2021, a guy by the name of Jeffrey Kemper wrote a poem uh, about Martin Luther. And Martin Luther, the reformer, the theologian, who was at one time a Roman Catholic monk, very concerned about his faith, but famously known, especially to us Lutherans, for standing before God and all people and saying that everything needed to come from the word of God and the word of God alone. And he suffered greatly for that, but we appreciate it, especially as we head toward Reformation Sunday. But Jeffrey Kemper wrote a poem about the levels to which Martin Luther stood by this word, this sola scripture. And he puts it this way. Allow me my defense now, if you please, 
Since I but dust and ash am prone to error, I summon all as Christ did once declare, bear witness, prophets and apostles, these. Should then attest if I am wrong, let flames consume my books, I'll curse them then and there. I am aware of the dangers of my claims and the dissensions that my doctrines breed. Yet joy in lieu of sorrow must proceed, for Scripture's gospel clearly bears these aims. As Jesus said, I came to bring not peace upon the earth, to bring a sword indeed. Since you require of me in simple speech, your highnesses, that I retract or not, I state it now, my faith cannot be bought. By pope or council for their overreach, of truth and inconsistency are clear. It is by scripture that my faith is wrought. If light does not from scripture's chandelier shine brightly to convince me that I err, and could my faulty judgment not repair, to scripture I cannot retract, I fear, to speak against God's word, so here I stand. I have no choice. God help me is my prayer. That's what the Reformation was about. The word of God. It's funny, I wonder if it ever came up as Luther's life was about to be taken, any argument about snacks. No, the word, the word. Scripture. Scripture is everything. Why? It's because it's not the what of Scripture, it's the who. The rest of our text in Hebrews tells us it's not about this as a book, it's about this as a who. Verse 5 of our text, for it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking, It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source." That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. The reason that everything is about scripture, the reason that the only thing that separates us, the church, from any social group, a social group you could start yourself, is the word of God, not because of what it says, but the who of what it is. Do you know that if you go through the entirety of Scripture, you will find Christ everywhere? In Jesus, you see, in in Genesis, rather, you see Jesus, your creator. You see your creation by him. In Exodus, you see the grace of your Passover lamb. In Leviticus, you see Jesus, the atoning sacrifice and the forgiveness of your sin. In Numbers, you see Jesus, the bronze serpent, the forgiveness of your sin. In Deuteronomy, you see Jesus, the ultimate promised prophet. In Joshua, you see Jesus, your great captain. In Judges, you see Jesus, your deliverer. In Ruth, you see Jesus as your family and redeemer. In Samuel, through Kings, through Chronicles, you see Jesus, your promised king. In Ezra, in Ezra, through Nehemiah, you see Jesus as the restorer of you as a people over and over again. In Esther, you see Jesus as your advocate. In Job, you see Jesus as your hope and the meaning and the ending of your suffering. In Psalms, you see Jesus as just simply your everything. 
In Proverbs, you see Jesus as the pattern of your life. In Ecclesiastes, you see Jesus as the only reality worthwhile in this life. In the Song of Solomon, you see Jesus is declared, sung love for you as his bride. In all of the prophets, you see Jesus, the coming of your hope for a prince of peace. In Matthew, you see Jesus as the king of kings. In Mark, you see Jesus, the servant of man. In Luke, you see Jesus, the son of man. In John, you see Jesus, the son of God. In Acts, you see Jesus ascended and sending forth the Holy Spirit to you. In every epistle, you see Jesus' indwelling and filling of his children. And in Revelation, you finally see Jesus returning and reigning in perfection and in glory forever, not a tear to be shed again. Everything in the word is Christ. Everything that distinguishes this gathering from every other gathering, from every social group, from every club, even the treehouse you formed as a kid is simply the word of God, because the word of God is Christ himself. I was standing in the preschool office the other day, and I saw a book on a shelf that was my favorite book as a little child. And if you know me, you'll know why. It's called Go Dogs Go. Any of you remember that book? Picture on the front with the dog driving a race car. Loved that book. Have to admit, still kind of like it. In fact, if everybody wants to get me a really expensive birthday present, find a first edition of Go Dogs Go. That would be, I don't even know if they make such a thing. But here's the favorite picture for me in Go Dogs Go when I was a kid. It's all these dogs going fast and race cars and then different things. And it's got a pretty simple premise. Uh, Go dogs go. Here's a dog that's going fast. Here's another dog that's going fast. And there's another dog that's going fast. So to me, this was Shakespeare when I was five years old. This was like, wow, (laughs) how brilliant, profound. But the best part is the end of the book, if you recall, and if not, look it up. All the dogs end up in this enormous tree. And that's where they're going. And at the end of the book, all the dogs have now climbed up into this enormous tree. There's hundreds of dogs and all sorts of different kinds, uh, all different shapes and breeds and, and, and sizes. And they're all just having a giant party in a tree. And they've got cake and different kinds of food and some have party hats. And they're all talking, probably all talking about their journey. And I'm sure they were talking about how fast they went. But it's just a gathering of dogs getting together, eating snacks in a tree. I love that picture. What joy. But the truth is, the truth is, is that's a fictional book. It, you know, I think. We gather around a different tree. The tree of life, the cross of Christ. That tree that is delivered only to you through the word of God. As Hebrews said, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. In this word of God, in your scripture, in the Bible, in your pew, and if you don't have a Bible, take one home. It's yours, free. Try to find one without any scribbles in it. Actually, those are more fun. But in this word, you will find more than a club more than a social gathering, more than friends, more than connection, and even more than snacks. In this book, in this gathering, you will find your soul beloved and forgiven and eternal. In the name of Christ, amen.